Welcome back for part two of the series, Is That How They See Me? In part one, the emergence of mass culture in mass society, and that fundamentally leading to interest amongst theorists and scholars to pursue better understanding of how media technologies, mass communication technologies and content are influencing and impacting the way in which we experience life and our behaviors. Um, after that, talked a little bit about the idea of semiotics and signs and symbols and what it is for the signifier and the signifier to work in, 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 in conjunction and create the symbol and, and, and basically the meaning that we make sense of with symbols. And then, of course, uh, discuss the cultural implications of meaning that are associated with various carriers of, of concepts, abstract concepts. And then lastly, in this connection with understanding uh, the media content in which we engage and we interact with, uh, we, I discussed uh, Stuart Hall's model of encoding and decoding and how the producer has a particular preferred meaning when he or she constructs all and puts together the signifiers and all these carriers of meaning and transmits that information to us in a text in the form of a movie or a video or sound recording or something. And then we as the audience make sense of that same information De determining our own meaning, considering what the signifiers are and how they're used. And as we make sense of that, that information, we walk away with one of three readings, the dominant in which we agree with what the preferred reading is and what the producer intends for us to understand, an oppositional reading in which we reject everything that the producers put together, and, and then a negotiated reading in which some things we accept and the rest of it we reject. Now, in this particular section, I would like to discuss hegemony and ideology. And so with that, we're exploring and understanding how power may be related to the social structure and how media contributes to this concept of power and who has control of society and, and the morals and the beliefs and the values that society uh, that society functions with. And then, of course, also would like to talk, talk to some degree about the idea of ideology and how media content may contribute and influence our uh, perceptions of self as well as others and, and just in general how we see the world and maybe how we fit into the world. So if we explore this concept of hegemony, a uh, component of Marxist theory and philosophy and that explores the superstructure of society and how there's this struggle for power amongst the haves and the have-nots in society. The haves, of course, being Marxist perspective, the bourgeoisie, and the have-nots being the proletariat. And there's this sense of the bourgeoisie, those haves having more control over the values, the beliefs, and, and the political and primary ideological institutions that help us to determine what our values and beliefs are for our respective society. Uh, a name that will almost synonymously, synonymously be accompanied with hegemony whenever you read up on this or you come across this phrase and, and, and try to understand what it is and what it means is that of Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci, of course, being the Italian theorist, um, helps us to better understand the relationship of power and dominance um, that Marx walks us down in, in, into this, this, this perception of how those who have control of the resources basically also have control of what we believe and think to be right and wrong in how we conduct our lives. So going further, we appreciate and understand that hegemony is an asymmetrical interdependence in which think about something being symmetrical, you think about it being balanced, you think of it being fair, equal, <clears throat> not necessarily fair, but definitely balanced and equal. Whereas with something being asymmetrical, we realize that it's out of balance. One thing is higher than the other. One thing has more power, more presence than the other. And in this sense, we are talking about a group of people, that being the bourgeoisie or those that are the dominant um, factions of society, having more power and more control over those who are the subordinates in the society. And those who, are ha who possess the power and the dominance have the ability to greatly influence our political, economic, and cultural relationships between all factions of society, between all social classes. And with this power, there's a certain level of surrendering that the subordinate class 
gives to the dominant class to allow this to take place. And this is where I step to the next component of this slide where Gramsci helps us to better understand that hegemony is part force and part consent. So in this concept of hegemony, we realize or appreciate that those that are in power that have the position of dominance utilize agencies such as the military, police, militia to restrain or to physically enforce their morals and their values and their beliefs. But there is also this component in which we or those that are a part of the subordinate class relinquish or surrender some component of our power to the dominant class so that they may maintain control of the society, of the, of the values, the morals, and the beliefs that a society carries. Now, if we discuss media and hegemony, I love this quote that comes from Malcolm X. If you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people you are who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. For me, this particular quote speaks to the very idea and concept that the media are not necessarily tools for democracy. If nothing, they are supposedly in this concept of hegemony, they are tools for the dominant class to perpetuate their morals, their values, and their beliefs. Ideally, yes, media are tools for democracy that encourage citizens to be better educated and enlightened about issues, topics, um, candidates, etc. In an ideal world, that's what media would serve for its citizenry. But in the world that we function in and under this concept of hegemony, the media are merely apparatuses. They are tools that the upper class, the social elites and used to um, extend their wealth, to extend the reach of their power, and most importantly, extend their status and their presence among society that and then in turn gives them the opportunity to further indoctrinate the society with their cultural morals, values, and beliefs. So the media, it it introduces us to, to certain ways of thinking. So something that we may not have thought of before or had been part of our, our daily experience can be introduced to us into the media and then all of a sudden take on a part of our consciousness, our awareness, and in doing so, shape how we respond to the world. Especially when you think about something being introduced to us via media, we think that, you know, I'm watching this on my television, I'm listening to it on my radio or downloading on my podcast, but at the same time, somebody else in our community, our immediate community, our national community, our global community, may be watching the same transmission, maybe downloading the same podcast to listen to. And in essence, this becomes a shared consciousness amongst us because of the ability and the reach of media. So Stuart Hall goes on to elaborate on this idea of media and hegemony um, by discussing media products that are there are actually messages and codes about the nature of society. So it becomes in 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 essence this this natural order of this is how the way the world works. We see it re regularly taking place on television. We hear it often in the music that we listen to. It, it's prevalent in the video games that we play. It's just natural. That's the way things seem to have been and that's the way things continue to be. So this relationship with the media and ourselves um, becomes this um, institution of social processes that allow for dominance to be extended by the repetitive messages, messages and contents that we are bombarded with through media. And so Karge puts it very succinctly when he talks about the construct of journalism. He says, some researchers have argued that journalistic construction of reality legitimate and reinforce the existing political and social order. And so it's very important for us to appreciate it and understand that from a journalistic perspective and even at an entertainment perspective, when we repeatedly get these messages and repeatedly are exposed to this content, it reinforces this concept that this is the way the world works. It always has and it always will work in this way. And in doing so, it begins to denigrate and inhibit our will and our, our, our push to want to dissent or resist against that natural world, world order. And so continuing with this understanding of hegemony, Stuart Hall goes on to 
suggest us that in framing of all of these competing definitions of reality, you know, when we're watching television, when we're listening to music, when we're, we're watching news programmings or, or surfing on the internet, we're exposed to a number of different competing definitions of what life is and the reality that we exist in. So there's a whole wide range of, of, of perspectives and thought. But the dominant class basically sets a, a parameter, a boundary, a limit that we are allowed to function in mentally and structurally in regards to how we make sense in, of this natural order of the world. And the subordinate classes' lives in, in, in all of this range, there is a limit. There is only so much that we are going to be exposed to and accept in order for the dominant class to sustain their dominance and rule over the subordinate class. So when we're accessing information and we're thinking, man, this is outside the box, this might be something that really takes it to and resists the hegemonic powers that be, uh, you got to keep in mind the hegemonic powers that be are ultimately controlling the tools, the conduits through which these messages are being passed. And they're only going to allow certain messages that are within their approval to be passed through the media, through these conduits to us as the audience and as society at large. And so here we have the idea again that hegemony requires that certain ideological assertions become basically self evident cultural assumptions. It's just, of course, that's just the way it is. It's, uh, it, well, why would it be any other way? Its effectiveness depends on subordinated peoples accepting the dominant ideology as normal, as reality, as common sense. And thus, hegemony often goes undetected. Um, utilize this example uh, if I can. Hopefully this works the way I am. I, I'm hoping it will. Um, if, if you haven't seen the movie, this is a little bit of a spoiler alert, but the Superman Man of Steel film starring Henry Cavill. Um, I remember when I watched this film and I came back and I was uh, teaching the course and I had a conversation with the students and I was just talking about how there were so many um, codes or, 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 you know, signifiers in regards to religion and faith embedded in the film and especially Christian oriented. And one of the students said, really, what, what, if there was? And, and I described to her a couple of the scenes. And these are the scenes that I have here on the uh, clip that you're looking at. In one scene, uh, the Superman character as his alter ego, Clark Kent, is in distress trying to figure out what direction and what next step he should take. And in doing so, he visits a church. He could have gone to a synagogue, he could have gone to a mosque, he could have gone to a number of different places. Heck, he's from Kansas. He could have gone out to a field and just thought for a while and tried to get the sense of direction. But what they do in the narrative of the script is send the Clark Kent character to a church. And he's in a very Christian-oriented church, as you see over his shoulder. He has the, the stained glass depiction of what is supposed to be Jesus looking up to the sky. And there's a Christian of undertone, undertone to this narrative. In another scene, again, spoiler alert to the film, if you haven't seen it yet, I apologize. But in another scene, Superman is blown out of a spaceship. And in doing so, as he's falling into space, he takes on this savior type, this um, Christ-like crucifixion pose, as you see in the image in which his arms are out as if he's crucified resonates very much with the, the images that we often perceive and come up with in terms of Christ being crucified on the cross and sacrificing himself for people. And of course, in the, in the essence of this narrative, Superman is supposed to be the savior of the world in this particular instance. So here we have a movie that was very popular, um, watched by millions of people, not only in the U.S., but worldwide, with some narratives and undertones connected to faith, but in those undertones and narratives, they are what you could consider of the dominant class. So those images are not shocking to their system. It just seems natural. It just seems normal. That's what he would do. Go to a church, speak to a priest, seek direction through Jesus. And then when you think of a savior, when you can conceive of somebody that gives themselves and is, is there to save the world, Christ would be one of those cool examples that come to mind. And so for Superman to fall out and take that crucifixion type of pose, that doesn't shock our system. It seems natural. It seems normal. Now, in this concept of hegemony, there's also a 
point in which there can be a counter hegemony, a counter culture in, in, in this idea of counter culture, counter hegemony. That is the sense that some portion of the subordinate class will resist the power of the dominant class. That, and this is often done through social movements. You can see it ex expressed through media. Stuart Hall goes on to demonstrate or suggest that ideological counter tendencies regularly appear in the seams and cracks of dominant forms, challenging the central political positions and cultural assumptions. In these performances, we often see demonstrated in various forms of popular culture, such as rap music, rock or graffiti artist and I tell you growing up in the 80s and the 90s I'm very I consider myself very much to be part of the hip-hop culture I grew up listening to rap loved the idea of break dancing was never much of an artist myself but can appreciate the the artistry of graffiti and being able to do those things and for me rap music was counterculture the dominant class is only going to allow but so much resistance to be present and that is the purpose of this image that you see here with uh from the, the matrix film franchise where you have neo standing before the architect and the architect in some ways represents that dominant class that bourgeoisie and neo is that subordinate class that proletariat that is supposedly going to rise up and resist the uh the um the dominant power but what is interesting about this narrative in this conversation again spoiler alert i'm sorry is that the architect suggests just that you're only resisting to the point in which I allow you to resist. At some point, I am going to shut this down. I've done it before and I will continue to do so. So go ahead and do what you think you're supposed to do to rebel against me and to, to, to mount your resistance. But I'm telling you right now and face to face, you're only going to get but so far. And so that is something that to take into consideration when we think about this idea of resistance by the subordinate class to the dominant class. And so with that, I move to the next slide and I suggest, and I'm not saying that this is absolute, this is my way of challenging you to think about what resistance to the, to the dominant class looks like, how it plays out, and how do we know if it's an authentic resistance that has the ability to sustain and move forward. When I look at this concept, when I think of this concept of resistance, again, I mentioned I grew up in the hip hop culture, so there are certain songs that are, are just like, part of my, my youth and my growing up. It's like, oh man, I remember where I was. I remember the year that that came out. And what you see on the left-hand side of the screen is a, a, a song by a rap group by the name of Black Sheep. The song is uh, titled Choice Is Yours. You can get with this or you can get with that. You can get with this. And as you see the video for this song, there are parts of this video that are rather grimy, that are dark, definitely very urban, very African-American centered, and so what you would think would be a resistance to like the heteronormative, middle-class, white male um, concept of hegemony. Yet, fast forward 20, 25 years later, this same song is utilized in a commercial for Kia cars in which you see the hamsters there standing next to the car are seen driving around in the Kia and doing other activities throughout the city to the song, you can get with this or you can get with that. I remember when I first saw this commercial, I was like, no, they've taken my youth. They've taken my, the resistance of this hip hop culture and turned it into a mainstream commercial watered down version of what it used to be. And so I suggest that resistance is futile or that the, the concept of hegemony um, would have us believe that resistance is futile because the dominant class only allows but so much resistance to be filtered through to the subordinate class. And then also in doing so, sometimes we'll take that resistance, reshape it, reconfigure it to make it marketable and consumable by, the, by society at large and for that subordinate class. So now we transition to this idea of ideology. And Hall, Stuart Hall suggests to us, ideology refers to those images and concepts and premises that provide frameworks to which we represent interpret and understand basically make sense of existence so when we think about making sense of life and self and others um another theorist comes to mind and that is uh jacques lacan lacan suggests to us that there's this mirror image in which when an infant sees him or herself in a mirror it starts to set off a chain reaction of 
who am I looking at? That's me. Oh yeah, and they see themselves, but then also within understanding and recognizing that they see themselves, they start to realize that they're seeing others when they interact with the world. And so now we are beginning to develop this sense of self and develop this sense of others. And through this mirror phase, we begin to build our ideology of who we are, what the world is and how we fit into the world and how others fit into the world. And so for the mirror stage, it is this configuration of one's ideas about oneself and others. And with this in mind, I suggest to you that media is also a form of that mirror in which in some ways we see ourselves reflected in media content and we begin to make an understanding of who we are, how we situate ourselves in this world, as well as making sense of who other people are. And so, of course, we also understand or appreciate that the media is yet one of a number of tools utilized to in, in, in indoctrinate us with certain values and beliefs. Now, if we refer to Althusser, he suggests that there are two apparatuses that are used by those that are in control of society. One is a repressive state apparatus, and that basically goes back to the idea of hege hegemony being um, disseminated through force. So there's the use of military, there's the use of police force, of militia, some form of physical exertion to get the subordinate class to fall in line. And then on the other side, there's the ideological state apparatus that utilizes the um, demonstration of values, beliefs, and what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, what is right and what is wrong to educate us, to enlighten us on what social values we should be growing up with and developing. And of course, these social, in social institutions include education, religion, family, and naturally, media. So then if we take this into consideration, it is like this nexus, this matrix of various parts of our lives that interconnect with one another that we pull from to better understand and to normalize life. This makes sense. This doesn't make sense. I learned this through my family. I picked this up in school. And so we're pulling from all of these social institutions to help us better understand how we are supposed to function. So if we take into consideration this concept of ideology and how media may contribute to it, we appreciate or we recognize that isms can be expressed through media overtly and inferentially, and whether it's racism, sexism, homophobia, xenophobia, whatever negative form of ideology that it is, it can be expressed and transmitted through media. When it's overt, it's okay, but open and favorable coverage is given to arguments, positions, and spokespersons who are in the business of elaborating on openly racist arguments or advancing a racist policy. And you see the images that are to the left of the, to the right of the screen, excuse me, are that of, of George Wallace, the once governor of Alabama, in one instance, he's sitting in front of a Confederate flag, giving that OK symbol. It's some speaking engagement that he has going on. In the other image, that's when he stands in front of the doors at one of the halls of the University of Alabama, preventing um, the first black students that had been admitted to the university from being able to attend or walk into the building. So we see this being that overt form of racism that is transmitted and shared with us through media content. Now, the inferential, that is a little bit harder to detect sometimes, and it takes a little bit more investigating a little bit of more understanding or observation to understand when we're dealing with inferential racism. And this is a moment and situation in which naturalized representations of events and situations related to race, whether they are factional or factual or fictional, have racist premises or propositions inscribed in them as a set of unquestioned assumptions. Now, what you see at the bottom of the screen is an interview with the little boy. It's probably some six or maybe eight years ago now in which there was a, a, a shooting in a neighborhood. And the on-the-spot reporter goes about interviewing people that are in that neighborhood and getting a sense of what they're feeling and how they're uh, making sense of what has just taken place. And in the midst of this interview, he speaks to this little boy. And while talking to the little boy, the little boy says, I'm going to go get me in because the, the interviewer says, well, what do you think? What are you going to do? And the little boy says, I'm going to go get me a gun. Now, of course, you're thinking, oh, my God, or you're potentially sitting there thinking, oh, my God, another black kid resorting to violence and going to get the guns and things of that nature. But as that was the edited footage, 
But the raw footage of this interview was leaked out to society and a lot of organizations that speak against racism and on, and on behalf of marginalized groups, one of such an organization being the NAACP. And the full raw footage, footage of this interview demonstrates the interviewer talking to the boy. Why? Well, what are you going to do? And the little boy saying, I'm going to get me a gun. The interviewer goes on to say, get you a gun. Why are you going to go get you a gun? And the little boy says, because I'm going to be the police. So that changes the, the entire context of this little boy responding and potentially us understanding who this boy is because now we've heard him say he's going to get a gun, but the reason and the motivation for him getting that gun is because that is what he sees of the police and the ability to protect. Potentially, maybe what his interpretation is to be able to protect this community because he says he's going to be the police and his understanding, hopefully his ideology of the police, is that they're supposed to protect and to serve the community. And so the only reason, I shouldn't say the only, but arguably the motivation and the rationale for the little boy wanting to get a gun is so that he can protect his community. But that is left out of the edited footage, that inferential racism that we walk away with when we see it on our news. Well, I want to thank you for joining me for this presentation and this discussion about the Geminian ideology and how media content plays a role in the struggle for power of understanding of self and others and how the world functions. Um, in our next presentation, I will be discussing concepts of masculinity and femininity, femininity and how media contributes to our understanding and our individual development and our collective development of appreciating masculine and feminine.